So what I want to do today is show you a project, an interview project that's in progress. It's not done. It's not, I'm not going to have the finished cooked meal ready to show. I'm actually going to actually in the throes of being in the middle of this project, demonstrate a thought process uh, associated with how to uh, use critical thinking, creative thinking skills to manage a complicated project. And so uh, for my demonstration purposes, I arranged to do an interview with the painter L.R. Montgomery. And I'm in the process of editing that footage right now. And I thought it would be helpful for you to see the process I'm going through. Uh, but I wanna make sure it's clear that there are a lot of different processes and a lot of different ways you could go about it. I'm presenting the system that makes sense for me and I think might be helpful for you to start thinking about how to sense make out of your own interviews that you're gonna be working on. So to begin with, I actually, did something I didn't think I would do, um, but it just seemed like a natural thing to do, which is I uh, imported my footage into Lightroom. And I know I shared this with you last time, but what I wanted to uh, just kind of to show the whole process is I literally um, used Lightroom to Number one, make sure I had a backup copy. That's one of the important reasons I use Lightroom is when I ingest content off of an SD card or when I ingest content off of a, a CF card, I am automatically making a second copy to another external drive. So I essentially have three copies of my footage, one on the SD card and two on separate hard drives. And so Lightroom manages the archiving of that for me. The second reason I use it is because I'm able to go through all the clips. If I turned off uh, this filter, you'll see that I had a lot of clips that I didn't choose to use. So here's three short clips. I picked the one that actually had something that I, that I liked in it. But let's just take a look at this other clip here and show you the other thing that I can do. In fact, I'll just take one of the, uh, I'll take the, see here's a clip that I end up not using okay so now if I hit E for loop which is this full screen mode right here and when you use Lightroom all the time you start to learn the keystroke command so G for grid E for loop and when I'm in the loop mode um, I should be able to uh, hit the play button on a video clip so here I can uh, hit the play button uh, to to play that video, okay? But now if I go D for develop, it says video is not supported in Lightroom for the develop module, and it's not. But if I go back to the loop view, I can create with this little gearbox here, I can tell it to uh, create a frame, capture frame. And what that's done is it's added that frame to uh, the Lightroom catalog and that frame can go to the develop module. And in fact, if I wanted to apply it, I could actually apply any of my presets that I have uh, in there or I can do a custom uh, correction. And just for the fun of it, I'm gonna apply this black and white just because it's pretty extreme, okay? And so now when I go back to my grid mode, I can take this uh, still frame that I've corrected and I can hold down the shift key, click on the video footage and hit sync settings. And it will sync the basic uh, color correction and profile preset if, I, if you wanna use them uh, and apply it to that video clip, okay? So now that's a workaround to actually do some color grading uh, in Lightroom if you choose to do it this way. And this is the, really the only uh, process that I would say that most people probably won't do the color grading in Lightroom. I happen to find it useful uh, because, I'm gonna undo that, because when I was going through and ranking my clips as to which ones I wanted to use because I had captured 
essentially over two hours of footage for this project. Um, being able to see that this clip's a little dark uh, compared to some clips later on because I had really difficult filming situation. I had uh, changing sky from cloudy to full sunrise and somehow I got to make this whole thing uniform and that's where color grading is to try to even that out a little bit. Uh, and then because I had so much footage, I needed to uh, uh, narrow down the clips that I actually wanted to work with. So Lightroom then allows you to do the color grading and then go to export and you can export your video files. Now it is limited to, um, I can do an unedited, but if I am gonna apply the color grading, I pretty much need to uh, export it as an H.264 and I can do the highest quality setting on here. So what I actually did then is I took all these clips and I just had Lightroom export it before I even brought it into Premiere. What, like, what pros and cons do you find doing it on Lightroom besides doing it just on the um, color grading tool in, on Premiere? So what, um, so what I ended up doing is I ended up still needing to do, I still need to do some color grading uh, in uh, Premiere as well. So for example, this clip is a little bit dark. And if I uh, go to my Lumetri color, one of the things that I like about Lumetri uh, color in Premiere is I actually have uh, more controls for both. I can raise the exposure, but I can bring highlights down. It's, it's a little bit more like the camera raw setting. It's got a few more adjustments to it. But what I liked about what I did process-wise is I like having the, the large thumbnails in a grid. I liked being able to quickly rough in my color grading. And then I do, I'm going to do my final color grading in Premiere. But it's, it, I think of it the way I think of Photoshop and Lightroom. Lightroom gets it probably 85% of the way and then I use Photoshop for the final 15%. Or to use a golf analogy, I think of Lightroom as pitching it onto the green, getting it really close to the flag, and then using Photoshop, or in this case, using Premiere to get it in the hole is, is to perfect it. And some of you might be using DaVinci Resolve. It's known for its color creating is supposed to be excellent. Uh, as well. So that's why I want to stress that when I'm presenting, to, what I'm presenting today is intended to show you the thought process and the problem solving, not to present a recipe or a formula that says you need to do it this way. You need to find the system that works best for you. But this is the critical and creative thinking skills that I applied to solve this particular problem. So now we are in uh, Premiere and I, I imported all the uh, color graded clips in here and I simply laid them out on a, a new timeline and I called this, uh, this painter's name is LR Montgomery, so I just called it LR Raw Footage. And what I did is I laid it out uh, all the clips and then I went through, and the challenge with video is basically for every second and every minute you record footage, you're going to end up watching every minute and every second of that footage in the, in the initial edit process. And what I did was I sliced and diced the footage and moved it to, uh, if it was footage, a clip that I thought I wanted to use, I moved it to video two for interview dialogue. And if it was B-roll, I moved it to uh, video track three. And so as you go down here, here is a, a B-roll. And you'll see I'm doing what's called cutting on the action where that bird started out of frame. And in fact, the cool thing about this is by cutting it like this, I can actually, um, I can actually do a rolling edit in here. And so you'll notice there it's out of frame and I have it cut to 
just where it appears in the frame, cutting on the action, because it just, it looks a little strange if you start with the blank screen and then it comes in uh, if you're trying to do continuity editing. Wouldn't have been a big deal for the first shot, but if I were doing multiple shots of a single A to B sequence, it would be a little off. So I just selected the section where the bird landed on the sign, and that's kind of my establishing shot. So now with the, uh, in Premiere, I'm able to use the up down arrow keys and you can see where I cut uh, all the various sections and which pieces I kept and see I'm not keeping any of this. And then here's the sound bite or, or the B-roll footage actually I wanted here. And what I tried to do is capture a lot of B-roll first and then do an interview later. So we have a lot of B-roll, although he tended to want to talk while he was uh, moving in here. But I just basically cut, and there's a clip that I decided I may want to use the audio from it, even though it's a rough, because I'm trying to record and, and walk beside him with a tripod. Okay, so that I thought I might want to use. So I went through, and, and as you can see, I basically have um, over two hours of footage, I think. Yeah, two hours and uh, about 20 minutes worth of footage, which is going to tell me a little bit about how long I think the final piece would be. And frankly, this gets at this idea of how do we evaluate how much time goes into editing? How do we evaluate how much the final piece would be? And how do we repurpose footage for different format links, different lengths of video? So if I were doing a um, out of a two hour uh, and 20 minute uh, video capture, typically you're only going to keep about 10%, 90% of it's going to be thrown out. Uh, it's going to be on the cutting floor. So that would tell me that if I were doing a full documentary piece from just this footage, I'd have about a 20 minute episode. Okay, but I'm gonna have to get it down to closer to five minutes uh, for the final cut, which means I am throwing out probably 98% of it. But I've got all this material to work with. How do I structure my story? And that's what I want to get at today is how do I structure my story? So now what I did was because I had these on separate tracks, I know that all these on V2 are the interview pieces. And I've, uh, you can see the big gaps in, in where I'm just picking sound bites that I wanted. And because while I was, uh, let me put it this way, as I was cutting and picking sound bites, I made a list of themes that uh, were being addressed in that content. And so I made a list of, uh, about five themes. Uh, at one point he talks about God and he talks about the meaning of his paintings uh, and nature. So there's a theme. So God and the meaning of birch trees and the subject of painting. Uh, there's another theme for Van Gogh in art history. Another one of talking about family uh, background and his experience with drawing as a child. Uh, work history. Um, uh, information about the location itself and then the creative process of how to make uh, the, the paintings. So what I did is I have all this separated out and all I would do is go to file new sequence and I made sure I was using uh, 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 a sequence that matched what my camera had, had recorded um, and so I've got that selected and I would just give a name uh, and I would just give the theme a name and create a new sequence. And then as I went through and reviewed each sound bite using the up and down arrow keys, uh, I was able to then just simply copy and go to whatever uh, sequence, right? And also what I, uh, so let me finish that thought. So I'd copy, I'd go to the sequence, and then I would uh, do a edit and paste insert to put it on that timeline without accidentally um, damaging any previous clips that I put on there, okay? 
and I'm going to undo that because I don't need that. I've already done all this work. So now I have separate timelines for each theme and I created an intro and an ending because as I was going through my sound bites, I'm trying to think about what's going to give me my hook to draw you into the story and what's my exit. And I don't, I don't have it figured out yet. Okay, this is important. This is work in progress. I don't have it figured out. But what I have is I have some potential options that just are how to wrap this up. It's just like a marriage that, you know, there will be faults, there will be things you leave in and things you overlook, but you just have to have that confidence with your skills and to keep, keep practicing and keep learning. And all of a sudden you walk away and you say, yeah, I, I did really, really good today. Yeah. So do you see why I might choose that as a potential um, ending on there? It's sort of wrapping up the day, you know, end of day, you can look back and say it was a really good day sort of thing. So it's a happy ending sort of thing, okay? So I've taken all the sound bites and put it into different sequences. The next thing I did was I took all of the B-roll clips. And by the way, just to be able to uh, show this to you, um, by stretching this out, okay, I can just grab everything that is on that B-roll uh, by just clicking and dragging my arrow uh, uh, cursor, right? This is the selection tool, V for selection tool. So just clicking and dragging and selecting that. Well, then all I did was put that onto a B-roll sequence. And then what I started doing is I started building visual stories. And so I started, uh, you know, there's kind of a, a beginning sort of thing, but I started building, um, putting clips together and building little sequences. And what I did for that is I actually put together a uh, separate sequence where I took clips that I needed to put together in a storytelling sequence and, uh, and I created a B-roll for his painting sequence. And so you'll see that I've built this establishing shot and we really don't need the audio. All you're gonna hear is wind, uh, very windy day that day. But there's my establishing shot, very cinematic. It's just a beautiful natural scene, beautiful light on the birch trees, blue sky coming through. So we go wide, we go tight, and we're going through uh, another close up. Uh, and we just kind of work our way uh, wide, medium, tight, wide, medium, tight. And I just went ahead and built this whole sequence. And I know that I'll be able to layer this over the top of audio so that what I'm doing is instead of just looking at a talking head all the time, you actually get this separation between what you see and what you hear that gives the viewer a little more reason to engage in thinking about what they're experiencing through the, the presentation. And uh, got some nice sound effects when he was setting his brushes down. And you can just see this whole process. There's the medium shot. There's some cutaway shots. So here we just kind of look up the sky because you know I, at one point he's talking about the wind and we're gonna include a clip about that. So we're focused on the sky and the wind and then getting in tighter to where I saw more branches blowing more vigorously. And so I just started building these sequences. And then what I'm able to do with that is you'll notice you don't see all the individual video clips. 
what I'm doing in Premiere, and I'll just I'll just show you how I do this. Let's just take these uh, these clips here. This was a, another sequence I was was playing with initially. Then I decided to build it out into a longer sequence. But basically, what I would do is select all the clips, and I go up under Clip, and I create a nest. And when I create a nest, I can then give it a name so that I've taken all those clips, I put them together in a story sequence, and I'll just call this uh, paint, uh, painting uh, B-roll uh, number two. Now it's taken and grouped all that together. Now, if I had audio in a separate, uh, in multiple tracks, then I would need to go to an extra step which is to group that. And I've already uh, grouped these clips right here. Uh, so I would uh, group the clip if I have multiple audio tracks underneath the video. So what that does is it actually acts like a sub clip. And I actually, for example, I had, uh, if I go back out here, I actually have these nest in here and for example here is a series of clips put together to um, when you double click on a nest it brings open the original sequence that you edited so that you can re-edit that particular nest and so here's a sequence of answers about the travel question so we'll just play this real quick my my wife and my daughters love to travel they did get me to go to africa to rwanda and I, I probably wouldn't have gone except that a doctor came and bought like 14 paintings and gave me the money to go. And even when we were in Africa, I thought I could go paint, but in Africa, I would always have 50 kids coming to follow me and hang out with me and ask me what, what I'm doing and what's going on. And, and it was a real fun experience but I didn't, I wasn't very productive. What I find is that they're always saying I could paint, but when you're a tourist, a lot of times you don't, you don't really take the time to see. And I love, I love to paint what I love. Now with iPhones, when she's traveling, she could show me Monet, she can show me Van Gogh's, she was, show me pictures of her standing in line for three hours to get into the loo and, and then you go you know i like it right here okay so i can always go back and tweak that edit but now i can place that whole thing on a timeline as a group when i want to add that to my timeline the other thing with this particular if i want to be able to just um easily add it to a timeline underneath something one of the things I can do is take this individual timeline and I can export it. If I'm really happy with it, I can export it as its own standalone clip and then bring that back into my project. Uh, and so that's another thing that I've considered doing on this project as well. And so I actually did that. Um, where did I do that? There it is right here. I brought it in as a MPEG uh, full quality video that I can now bring in and now I can just grab that audio only and throw it underneath my B-roll where I want it, okay? So you generally, and I'm not worried about these gaps in the conversation, I'm worried about pacing the audio because I can always cover those gaps with cutaway shots or B-roll footage, okay? Does that make sense? So now I end up with, a, I've got a lot of timelines here. When I'm starting to put the puzzle together, I then create a radio cut draft one. And that's where I'm at right now, as a matter of fact. I'm working on radio cut draft number one. And I will tell you that your first draft will always be far too long. It's that whole, you got to, you know, kill your babies. It's the, how do, you, how do you choose which clips to keep, which ones to leave out? 
but this is where two things need to occur because there's always two things. Number one, we need to lay it out the way we initially trust our gut to do it. And then we got to let it alone for a day, maybe two days, and you go back and you make a duplicate copy of this. So what I do is I'll come back to this and I'll show it and I'll say, uh, I'll click on the little hamburger menu and I'll say reveal sequence and project. There's my sequence right there. And what I will do is go to edit and duplicate and I will call this draft two. And then I'll open up draft two and I'll just kind of go through this and I'll be a little more brutal on the cutting because what's happening is when you're first editing, especially if you filmed it, this is the problem of editing your own work is when you uh, are filming it, you fall in love with your footage. And when you're working on building these initial B-roll, uh, I, I call them puzzle pieces, when I put these initial sequences together and when I put these sound bites together, you have fallen in love emotionally with this content. And you need a little time and distance to, to separate the initial enjoyment of it to the ability to come back with a uh, very narrow focus of, okay, what is the core concept I'm trying to get across in this story? And I can't go down all the rabbit holes that I would like to go because it's not a novel. That is also to say that because we're working in multimedia where the majority of the time this work is gonna be distributed through the internet, I have the luxury of starting to think about this as what is my cinematic piece? What is my, my star uh, piece? And then what are behind the scenes uh, outtakes that I could build into blog posts or other social media? And so while I've got great sound bites about art history and about the process of painting and about all these different things, for my primary piece that I need to be not more than five minutes, I'm gonna to have to be brutal in cutting that down. But now I might have other clips to continue to add content online for, uh, because they're really good sound bites. So the neat thing about multimedia is you've got these projects and I might have this one project that I wanna uh, uh, pitch to Northwest Profiles and, and it's going to be maybe a, a, a five to 10 minute segment. You know, it depends if it's going broadcast news, it might be a, a, a three to five minute. If it's going to a, a web, or a, not a web, a, if it's going to a news magazine like a Northwest Profiles, then it might be a 10 to 15 minute piece that they would call for. And so I can shop this. I've got all this footage. I've got all these great sequencing. I can repackage it in multiple ways. But I just want to show you, for example, this is just a rough cut I'm working on. I think nature is the handprint of what all that God has created. The more you study art and study painting, what happened, the paint tube was invented so people could go outside. So that's already too long. It's, it, you know, it would be a nice feature length German documentary film and I would maybe have a little music track and some more bird calls, etc. But the reality is I've got to cut this quite a bit. So I like the beginning. And I like this. So I might go ahead and there is a, a delay, delay, delay. And as much as I like the sound of closing doors, I'm probably going to end up cutting it about there. And, uh, and then coming And I'll probably back it up to right about there, cutting on the action. And so I'm going to end up deleting that whole section right there. 
And now my, I'm going to pull this up here. And here's the thing about editing video is we only use three um, basic cuts. Well, there's different J cuts and L cuts and that sort of thing, but uh, transitions, excuse me. We only use three specific transitions. We don't do a bunch of fancy special effects. We use a cut when it's a continuation of the action. Uh, we use a dissolve to denote a lapse in time. And we use a fade through to black, fade to black or fade through to black to denote the beginnings and endings of chapters or segments, okay? So in this case, I'm gonna denote a lapse in time between when he <laughs> set the, uh, the footage here. There's a jump cut, that's, a, that's an awkward cut. So I'm going to hit a dissolve and soften that to denote that there was some time lapsed. And then I'm gonna bring these clips up, these sound bites, I'll bring them up further. And now I can come in here and uh, grab, I don't see, I have a lot of sound bites in there. I'm gonna to have to cut this back a bit. So I cut too much on there. So that's okay. What I'm gonna end up doing is I'll just slide this part over and then I'll back this up. So it's a, always a give or take. It's a puzzle that, that you move something, you're gonna readjust it. Study art, study painting. What happened, the paint tube was invented. So people could go outside. I've been a painter for about 15, 20 years. In this landscape, you have everything you could ever want to paint, whether you want agriculture, whether you want uh, birch stands, whether you want water. By the way, these are gaps that need to be filled in with the ambient tone, and I'll do that before I go to the next uh, stage after I get the edit done a little bit more. I know this area is like the back of my hand. I know where to go, and I know where to, uh, on a given day, where you would go paint and where not to go paint. I started the painting. So there, we're kind of, uh, we've got, we're gonna actually make that a cross dissolve between the two clips. I started the painting right in here. And so I'll probably go, I try to get off the trail enough that uh, I'll find, go in over here and, and paint. I always try to find a little place off the trail, I painted this same scene maybe probably about 10, 15 times. So I just kind of have memorized what I want to paint and what I want to say. So already that's gotten way too long. In love with the footage, but now coming back with a day break, I'm like, yeah, ready to let go of some stuff, right? Because I want it to move along the story. And the story is not about uh, the fact that he knows where to go and, and, and uh, has all these memories of painting it. The story is really gonna be more about the fact that um, why he paints, how it relates to the study of uh, Van Gogh and Impressionism, his style of painting, and the fact that he would rather paint there than go travel uh, around the world, okay? And so I will have to compress this way down. Uh, and this is where you start to pay attention. You, you know, you've got all these wonderful so clips. The first thing I do is figure out what I, what I want to paint. So I've made these viewfinders and this one is set up for a 12 by 16. I've got a little hole in the middle of it to identify what really colors I'm looking at. So I use this a lot to get a composition. So I'm always looking for uh, 
trying to figure out foreground, background, or where I'm going to set up to paint. And so I, I squint, I spent a lot of time just squinting, trying to figure out uh, what I can bring into the composition to make it the basic shapes. I'm looking for shapes and not so much detail. Squinting is probably the most valuable tool you have. With so right there, if I were making a how to paint video, an instructional video, maybe I'd want to include those clips. But the reality is this is not a instructional video. This is a narrative story. A, um, it's not a how to, it's a why video, uh, so to speak. So I will have to get rid of all that uh, in the final cut because it's just too much redundancy, too instructional, not enough inspiration. Uh, but I might keep this because, it, because basically the story is I'm going to a location that I've painted many times, setting up to paint, finishing this painting. And, uh, and so this is an important setup. The easel is important. You always, there's so many things that go wrong with French easels, but they drive me crazy. So I like the idea of revealing that um, the French easels drive them crazy because they're so complicated to set up. Uh, but now I'm going to have to cut a bunch of this out. This is just really redundant. You know, I've got these close-up cutaway shots. As much as I love them, I'm not making an instructional video on how to set up a French easel. So this is all getting in the way of my story. Now that shot, cutting to that shot would make more sense. Okay, so I would probably come in here using my arrow keys. And I'll keep this one. The, the, hard, the hard part about being a painter is figuring out all the equipment you need to be a painter and knowing what you like and knowing what works and what doesn't work. You always, there's so many things that go. So now I know I'm going to delete these clips and delete that clip. And I might keep that one. And I'll just shrink that up. So I'm hitting uh, the space between clips and hitting delete. And now I'll do a cross dissolve because I need to show that there's a lapse in time for continuity's sake. So we'll just... Crazy. There, we just shrunk that up. It makes all the sense in the world. And then we're setting up the easel. These are carriers that I've made for wet... And then my cross dissolve got screwed up because of one of my cuts, but that's okay paintings and so a lot of times if you don't finish a painting I'll, I'll bring it back so I'm keeping this because this is introducing another micro challenge first challenge is knowing what equipment to, to, to be able to paint in the field second challenge is uh, the easel third challenge is how do you transport wet paintings okay so now that's worth keeping I think and so this is what I'm going to work on today is finishing the painting that I started, I think it was two or three days ago. The sun's coming from this direction, so it's going to illuminate these birch trees right on the side. And so it's just... So there I shot some B-roll footage to try to get a similar, to show the subject that's in the painting that we just saw in the close-up of the painting. This is perfect time is when I started this painting. So we only probably had like uh, maybe an hour, half, two hours uh, to finish this painting. And as, a, as I'm looking at, uh, as, as the sun comes out, the colors. So now we've got another, another conflict that's worth keeping, but he stutters and stammers. And so I will need to go in 
and cut that down and cover those cuts with B-roll to make it a nice continuous, <coughs> <coughs> to make it a cohesive, continuous statement, okay? A complete statement, if you will. And one of the challenges I uh, had with filming him is because he would start an idea and then he would end on a different one. He never really completed things and I have to, through the editing process, I have to build a complete thought and I will edit this down. And the easy way to edit it is to look at the waveforms. There's a really long blank pause where the waveforms are flat. And so I'll be able to cut and bring those closer together to get the statement without all the pausing and stammering. And then I'll be able to cover that up with some cutaways. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yep, so, so what I'm trying to do is I'm introducing a series of micro challenges. I'm keeping the conflict and I'm jettisoning the purely informational only piece, okay? Uh, and, and I think that's the important part is, is just keeping the content that tells a strong central story. Uh, and so here, I'll definitely, the fact that there's only two hours to paint is a real challenge. And so this is, this is a, a iPad outer box that I converted for my palette. Wow, that's a really cool thing that he's taken an iPad Otter box and he now uses it as a palette because he doesn't have to worry about his paints drying out. He, does, he can have his paint palette pre-mixed, which helps him speed up. But this is not an instructional video and I have to be brutal in cutting this down. So that's got to go. See, this is the thing about a French East look. You don't have everything. Again, this is a detail about how if you don't have it put together right, it'll tip over easily. And it would be great for an instructional video. It's not great for this particular video. So that'll go. But I'll create a separate video that'll be how, a how-to video that can go on his blog post. So now... And actually, I need one more piece, and I may have cut that out. Let me just double check here. Sure. I may have just accidentally deleted it. So I'm gonna just listen here. Or giving a demo. Usually, it, it falls. I I did a demo once, and one of the legs just collapsed. So now I'm gonna cut that because now he's putting the easel on. I need that part of the story visually, right? And so that's just the joy of having a French easel. But now that is out of context, so I'm going to have to just eliminate the audio part of that and put something else underneath it. So I will just tell that story visually and I will find a sound bite that helps drive the story forward. Although the challenge there is you see his mouth moving. So now how do I deal with that? Well, if I were shooting a 4K camera, that'd be no problem, wouldn't it? Because a 4K pro, uh, camera allows me to zoom up to uh, 200 or 100% zoom. So two, 2K images, uh, normal HD video. And if you got 4K, that means that you've got twice as much information as you need to be able to do uh, multiple cro uh, croppings to create a sequence very easily. Well, I don't have that luxury, but I can get away with some things anyway, uh, because the fact of the matter is this is going for a website distribution more than likely, and uh, I can easily bring this up probably, probably about just about 150% without overly losing my image quality. And then I can still see his cheek, so I need to just move that over. And it's, 
and I might need to bring this down a little bit. Now, it's not the best composition, but it is, you know, these are the problem solving. Every video edit is a problem solving exercise. So now that visually tells the story. And I want you to notice that when you're playing back video, the, uh, there's a yellow bar up here saying that I'm just gonna play it back as a rough draft. It's not gonna be high resolution, but when you export it, it will export a high resolution frame, frame by frame export. And so when I hit the pause button, you see how sharp that is. But when I hit the play button, it goes blurry. Can you tell that? Okay, so now I'm w lingering way too long on this. So what I'll do is I'll go back and I just start, I, I consider editing a exercise in biofeedback and I will just pay attention to how I'm feeling. When do I start getting antsy to move on? And I'm antsy. So now I'm gonna cut. I'm gonna make sure I didn't miss it. Yeah, see, that's just extraneous footage. So now I'll do a cross dissolve. And now we are into the painting sequence that I showed you earlier. Okay. So I guess the ideas that I wanted to get across is this idea of a project can have as many sequences as you need to be able to get your thoughts organized. Some people would go through and when they uh, got to this point here, uh, you know, let's go to, um, let's go to this clip here and let's just listen to a clip. Yeah, I've been coming here for 15 years, seven, maybe 17 years. And see, I cut out a little gap there. So here we could just, you know, uh, make a nest. And we can uh, start to name these. Uh, I came here uh, 15 to 17 years ago. Now, if I don't need a nest and I just have an individual clip. I know this area is like the best. What some people will do is, and I have done this a lot in the past, is I will make a subclip. And what that does is if I make a subclip, which is command U on a Mac or control U on a PC, is it allows me to uh, give it a name that is not a transcription, but it just gives me a good idea. So uh, I would just say, I know this like, the back of my hand. And so now I've got this sub clip right here that is organized by the idea. And so this kind of gets back to when we talked last week about uh, pitching, putting a pitch together involving a transcript, if you will. Well, I'm not going to the trouble of transcribing the entire interview uh, if I were doing a, a, a full documentary, I would, by the way, I would hire a transcription service. But what it does allow me to do is start to build a outline, an editing outline, where I organize my thoughts by the sound bites, and I can actually write out a script because most of the time in a project like this, I'm going to end up developing a voiceover narration to create bridges between concepts. So I might be, I might, one of the problems I had was that L. Arc would not pronounce his name in a way that was usable to me. He was too staccato and it just blew out my mic every time he did it. And he'd just say, I'm L. R. And then he'd, and then he'd settle down. Well, I might have to substitute a voiceover that says, L. R. Montgomery is a professional painter who has been painting at Slavin Conservation Area for almost 18 years, and then cut to uh, his, his sound bites. So in developing a script or an editing outline, I can use these subclip names to help organize it. One of the things that I, um, I debate about subclips 
is that if I take this clip, let me just go ahead and create a new sequence. In fact, the easiest way to do it would be to uh, click right here on this clip and just go new sequence from clip. And I do this a lot because it makes sure that the video and audio settings of my sequence are accurate for what the camera has. So if I have that in here, you'll notice with a sub clip, I can't do a rolling edit to add or subtract. I can subtract, but I can't add back anything. So I have to be really accurate with my uh, clips. And if I zoom in here and bring down this audio waveform, what you have to be careful with is that if your waveforms go right up against the edge, you're not going to have any room for a cross dissolve. Meaning I need a little bit of headroom and a little bit of pre-roll and post-roll to be able to do a cross dissolve between this particular clip. So it would be, um, that's why I tend to use nested clips more than using sub clips because the nested clip always gives me the ability to go back and re-edit those clips to cr create that, that pre and post roll that I might need for an edit. So as you can see where I'm at now is I actually need to go back and finish my radio cut draft one and get the basic sequence of ideas put there, put on the tracks. Um, I've got my kind of B-roll things sequenced together pretty good uh, in terms of the painting sequence. I feel good about that. But now I just have to stick to the cohesive central concept, which is, uh, you know, at the basic level, as Jason Nix says, at the most basic level, a story is someone did something. At the basic level, L.R. Montgomery makes a painting. Okay, that's the basic. So anything that is extraneous to the making of this painting, I need to get rid of. And then I'm looking for hooks, conflict, and context to create meaning in this story, that this painting takes on more meaning. And so um, one of the things that uh, I made a nested clip earlier uh, of this soundbite which is one, two, three, four clips put together in sequence. And, and don't, I'm going to mute the, uh, uh, mute the video and let's just listen to this little uh, clip, sequence of clips here. Now, as I'm looking at these leaves and I think, how do I paint that? And so that pre presents a problem for me to solve. And it, that's a real minor problem. A lot of people have big, big problems and I'm trying to figure out how to, paint and I see these blues and I see these greens and then I see these yellows and I, I say oh I know how to make that color I know how to make that color the problems that I have are not really significant to the whole world you know we can't solve all the world's problems but I can just take care of my family and and paint and love each day and love everybody that I come in contact with what I, I just read that the only people without problems are the people that are in the cemetery and your problems define really, you know, uh, it has a solution and how much time are you willing to invest for the solution? And I think Jimmy Buffett, he said that there's a song that talks about going to Paris with lots of questions, looking for answers and ends up in, in a song, he goes all the way around and he ends up back in Florida fishing. Okay, so now I need to, I'm definitely gonna need to cut that down. It's a little long, but they're all on this theme of what are big problems, what are little problems, and, uh, and how do we relate that to other people in the world having problems. Uh, and so I'll cut that down, but because it's a nested clip, I can go back in at any time and re-edit it. Just to summarize, uh, we went out and had a rough idea of what the story might be, had a list of questions, and focused on doing two things during filming. One is to film an interview, and the second is to film 
the uh, process part of it, the B-roll uh, in a way that has wide, medium, tight shots that allow me to build uh, a visual variety in my B-roll footage to cover up the edits of the audio because I know I'm going to be chopping that up. And we call this non-linear editing because we're able to move sound bites around. And in some cases, we're constructing a sentence by changing the sequence of the word order. Uh, you have tremendous power in editing to put words in people's mouths, so to speak. Uh, and so we have a, a, a responsibility to ethically put it together in a way that we believe feels, uh, fulfills the spirit of the original intent of the person we're being interviewed. And I also want to make sure I'm, I'm reflecting honestly the personality uh, of this person. So I've recorded the footage. Uh, realistically, I'm going to throw out 90 to 95% of that footage. Um, and the footage that I fell in love with that I threw out has the potential to be repurposed into shorter uh, specialty video clips that could go on a blog, a website to do some other things. And so one project could have five different uses for it. And then I brought them into Lightroom uh, because it allowed me to see them on a grid side by side uh, to select video clips that I wanted to use, do a preliminary ranking uh, system with a uh, star system, and do a preliminary color grade, and then export it out of Lightroom into a project folder that I created. And one of the reasons I like creating the project folder before opening Premiere is because when I open Premiere to create a new project, the first thing I want to do is to save that project into the project folder where the video clips are because otherwise you run the risk of Premiere losing a link to a video that you've been editing with. Uh, and so that's just a real safety feature that, that, uh, that I've built into it. Also, I use Lightroom because it allows me to create multiple archive copies of everything I'm doing. So I have backups and this is an important part of my professionalism. Uh, and then uh, cutting the clips and just raising them up to video track two and three, depending upon if it's a sound bite, I, I put it on, uh, if it's a sound bite that I want to use for my final video, I'll put it on video track two. If it's B-roll footage, I'll move it up to video track three. And then I can actually visually see on track one all the raw footage and see what percentage I've thrown out versus what I think I might use. And then I go back and review just the clips th that are on video tracks two and three, and I organize those into sequences based upon the themes that they share in common. Once I've got all the sequences organized by themes, I create my first draft radio cut. And the radio cut is focused just on how does the story sound. We don't get lost in the details of the B-roll. Uh, we rough it out, but we don't worry about the gaps in the audio cuts. We'll fill those in uh, when we're ready to do a fine cut. We do a radio cut, and then if it's a complex project like this one was, I'll do a second radio cut where I give a day break and I go back to it. I've still got my original cut, but now I'll go back to it a day or two later and I will think about what is the best, most clear, concise storyline and I will get rid of all the clips as much as I love them, I'll get rid of them in order to tell the most smoothest, quickly paced, I mean, pacing will also be influenced by the music track, but basically we, we, we wanna keep it moving at a pretty rapid pace because we know that today's audience doesn't have the patience to watch a long form uh, film. We wanna make sure we, we have a nice flow, but that we keep it on central point. And I think the part that I really was able to get across to you today was understanding the difference between making a how-to video and getting rid of all the contextual clips that are focused on the how-to rather than the actual meat of the story uh, that we want to tell. And so that's a, the first uh, go around to, to get rid of those how-tos and focus more on the why and the story and the symbolic meaning that's created through that uh, journey, that hero's journey. And so I'm keeping the conflict, I'm getting rid of the extraneous. 
Uh, and then I showed how to create nested clips. And, and literally, I'm creating little puzzle pieces of putting little things together that, that made sense to me visually. So I put that B-roll together of all the painting clips to tell the wide, medium, tight, the cutaways uh, of what is that story as if it were a silent film, could I tell a story on how, to, how he makes a painting? Yes, I could. So I put that together and nested it. And then I took sound bites and put them together based upon a cohesive idea and nested those together. And then I bring those two elements together onto my radio cut. And then I create a duplicate of that radio cut to eliminate the extraneous. Uh, and then ultimately we'll get to a fine cut where I will fill in all the sound gaps with the ambient uh, wind noise. In this case, my big challenge for this project is uh, there's so much wind that day and it ebbs and flows. So it goes from high wind to low wind. And so his sound bites are across a range of winds. So I'm actually having to fill in. He might be in a low wind sound, but if I placed it right next to a high wind sound bite, I'm going to have to put the high wind fill in to, to even it out. And, and that's where a big part of editing is to even out the audio levels and even out the color grading. And so we talked a little bit about how I'll do my final color uh, grading in Premiere uh, to just make sure as I'm sequencing it, everything looks like it was continuous. We use that word continuity editing where we don't want to dislodge our viewer from the flow of the story by having this weird you know, oh wait, my exposure changed on this clip. It just doesn't match. And so we want to match on action, match on color, match on uh, uh, audio levels as we go through the story. And then I will end uh, with the fine cut. I'll actually add a little bit of light music track to it to just soften and add a little more emotive quality to this uh, piece. And then the final cut will be when I add titles and any graphics. And so one of the things I'm looking at doing is you saw he had a logo sign on his print, uh, uh, on his canvas holding case. And I will probably take and convert that to a black and white logo that I'll end or begin the film with just to give his name. And then I'll put my production credits at the end. So that, in a nutshell, is the complete process of putting this together and why uh, I think it takes probably a, a week to, to do this project, a week from the time you've recorded your interview uh, to be able to give yourself the editing time that you need. Now, in realistic, in uh, broadcast journalism, you might be expected to edit two to three stories in a day which means you're pretty much going to have a talking head and a voiceover narration and maybe a, a host on camera. And you're going to go wide, medium, tight, and it's going to be a very focused, it's only going to focus on one key idea. There's not going to be the depth of context and, and, and that sort of thing. It's just going to be focus on the conflict, focus on a resolution if there is one, uh, and it's going to be short and sweet. And so you would be, as a broadcast journalist, of which if you're paying attention to the job postings, there are uh, a lot of jobs uh, that come open in broadcast journalism that the skills that we're doing in this class would qualify you to go out and do. But what you'd want to have is a video reel of several short uh, minute and a half to two minute pieces, and you need to have the confidence to be able to go out and produce it in one day. But for this sort of longer form, a little more depth, three to five minutes, uh, I think of this more as a news magazine piece rather, or a feature uh, story, then I would think about a week to put this together uh, is about right. And so uh, I wanna encourage you to just dive into your project and, and really record your interviews and then problem solve from there. And that's really the, the key to this is to just get the raw footage and then it becomes a problem solving exercise from then on. All right, that is what I have for you today. Uh, any questions and was this helpful?